a KQED television production. Closed captioning of this program is made possible by support from the Fireman's Fund Foundation. On our news panel, which candidates have the muscle in the California governor's race? The latest in the battle over water and healthy San Francisco in the spotlight at the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll hear from inmates on California's three strikes law and examine its effect on the state's overcrowded prisons. And a story that takes us to the moon, coming up next. Hello, I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to the new This Week in Northern California. We're back with the familiar and the new, and we thank you for your letters and your emails during our absence. We also want to thank the many people who worked hard behind the scenes for the past three months. Now, stories from the news this week. President Obama was awakened early this morning to find he'd received the Nobel Peace Prize. I am both surprised and deeply humbled by the decision of the Nobel Committee. Let me be clear, I do not view it as a recognition of my own accomplishments, uh, but rather as an affirmation of American leadership on behalf of aspirations held by people in all nations. And that is why I will accept this award as a call to action. In San Francisco, UCSF biologist Elizabeth Blackburn shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discoveries around chromosomes leading to new research on cancer, aging, and stress. A limited number of the H1N1 vaccine was released intended for high-risk groups, including pregnant women, children, and healthcare workers. And after months of pressure from residents and business owners, the Oakland City Council rolled back parking meter enforcement from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. The rate stays at $2 per hour, though. The former mayor of Oakland, Jerry Brown, has pulled far ahead of his rivals for the job of governor. Carla Marinucci of the San Francisco Chronicle have that story for us tonight. And Paul Rogers with the San Jose Mercury News has the latest in the battle over water. Bobby Galco, also at the Chronicle, on the healthy San Francisco case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Carla Marinucci, headlines about a race that's still a year away. Yeah, yeah who would have thought it, Bill? <laughs> I mean, uh, look at already a full throttle battle for headlines, for money, and who's the guy sitting in the catbird seat? It's somebody who really isn't even campaigning, <laughs> Jerry Brown, a two former two-term governor of California, current state attorney general, 20 points ahead in the polls of Gavin Newsom, the mayor of San Francisco, and ahead of everyone else in the field. You know, Newsom had his moment in the sun this week with uh, former President Clinton coming to the state to endorse him, uh, but he has got a big challenge ahead of him. And so, it turns out, does the billionaire uh, former head of eBay, Meg Whitman, she's in a dead heat with a guy who's on a shoestring budget, <laughs> uh, Tom Campbell, uh, while Steve Poisner, the insurance commissioner, is way back in the field. So this is getting very interesting, very fast, and very dirty, I may add. <laughs> well, those seem like the two main headlines, which are very surprising out of this, which is that this race is Jerry Brown's to lose, and he hasn't even announced his candidacy. He's 20 to 25 points ahead of every single Republican yeah. candidate in a matchup. He hasn't done any campaigning. Meg Whitman has spent $19 million. Absolutely, Paul. And Jerry I mean, Brown is not even in the same that, universe. This just with shows, I, mean, I think, the, the advantage when you're talking about a guy who's been in California politics for 40 years, uh, the name recognition is mm -hmm. huge, but he's also got 40 years of history that he's going to have to deal with when those ads start and uh, when the Republican comes up against him. If that's the case, it isn't over yet. I think we'll put All you right, know, let, let's play a wait, wait yeah. here. You say he's not campaigning. Yet he files a lawsuit a week against somebody. <laughs> you got a good point. He has a headline that <laughs> Gavin Newsom can't buy. You know, they're absolutely right. Because he has the job that allows him he's, to do he's it. He's turning out press releases as we speak on everything he's doing to protect the people of California mm -hmm. as a state attorney general. Bob, you know this in the legal area. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you get it all the time. 
This is his. This is the way he's running this race. He's not making speeches. He's not doing debates. Newsom has challenged him to 19 debates. Uh uh, ain't gonna happen. Well, we're, you know, for 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 a Democrat or one of these declined states who can vote in the Democratic Party. What's the difference between them, other than the Jerry's been around the track and, and uh, Gavin and, has been know, around a, a shorter <laughs> show? Do they differ on anything? Important that we know about. You know, we got we got your three strikes. You know, we got the budget. Yeah. We got mar marijuana legalization. We got gay marriage. You come, where you are come they, exactly where they to, the, yeah. to the point. You know, and yeah. then Gavin Newsom's big challenge. Right. They really don't differ, at least as far as you know, on yeah. too many things. Newsom yeah. wants to make this about a it makes this a change election, yeah. a generational thing. There is a 30 year difference between these two guys. That's the biggest difference ever in a governor's race. Whether people will take that into account, I think that's a factor Newsom has got to hope happens. But right now, Jerry Brown has got it all over uh, any of these candidates. One of the things that leapt out of me at that field poll this week was that 50% uh, of Republican voters have not made up their mind yet. So even though Whitman and Campbell are supposedly tied, that seems wide open. In the Democratic side, only 25% of Democrats say they haven't made up yeah, their mind. Absolutely. Now, what could trip Jerry Brown up? Although, frankly, at this point, it doesn't seem like Well, you know, much. it is a long time. You know, you know, this is a number of months, long time in any political race. One statement, one story can make all the difference in the world, which is why, you know, Dianne Feinstein in that field poll still showed up the strongest candidate. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, at the end, somebody else but might But she's not it. getting in, right? She, she's not uh, at all. By all accounts, no, but I think, you know, lots can happen from now until then. And as for, and, Ma as for Meg Whitman, you know, all the headlines are about, you know, did she vote, did she register, when, and all that stuff. I guess I'm sort of more interested in mm -hmm. her, her promise to eliminate 40,000 jobs. How is she going to do that without getting rid of half <laughs> that, of the prison guards? That guys? is her biggest challenge. Yeah. You know, aside from the fact that she yeah. hasn't voted uh -huh. a whole lot, yeah. we haven't heard how she's going to eliminate anything. She's mm -hmm. not debating. There's another debate mm -hmm. next week. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she's doing very limited media. Uh, no answers from May women on a lot of uh, the, the critical issues, and I think she's going to have to come up with them in the well, next couple Well, our, our current governor, though, made headlines this week, too, mm -hmm. because, uh, well, he's threat making some pretty <laughs> interesting threats, and uh, all of it uh, seemed to have water as the backdrop for his yeah, moves. Uh, the state legislature this year passed uh, about 700 bills, uh, Republicans and Democrats. Many of these bills aren't even that controversial. Um, he threatened uh, this week to uh, terminate uh, all of them, to veto <laughs> just about all of them, I should say, unless he gets a big water deal. Um, now, as many people know, we're in the third year of a drought. Uh, the amount of water that can be pumped from the Delta, the main source of water for two-thirds of Californians, has been reduced, uh, in part because of the drought, mostly because of the drought, frankly, but in part because of the Endangered Species Act with salmon and smelt and other fish. And Republicans have pushed hard for the president to drop the Endangered Species Act. There's provisions that he can do that under emergencies. Democrats have pushed back and said no. And what Arnold's pushing for and the Republicans and the farmers are uh, $12 billion in new dams and also the so-called peripheral canal. Well, people are asking, what, about, talking about politics, why is he pushing it, uh, wanting to shoehorn this in, demanding that it happen in a couple of days? This affects millions of Californians mm -hmm. and billions of dollars. Well, what is the big the, rush to the do clock it is, The clock is ticking on him. Uh, his governorship is up in a year. Frankly, a lot of his legacy is in tatters. If you go back and look at what he ran on, uh, he said he was going to blow up the boxes, eliminate the deficit yeah. spending, get the parties together. No, 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 no. He, he will be known as the Republican environmental governor. And I think he's really been shocked when he's gone down to Fresno and some of these places and seen the anger uh, of Central Valley people Fresno against him. Fresno hates San Francisco. <laughs> well, gets, they're angry for different angry reasons. Too. Well, yeah. you know, it's a legitimate debate. Yeah. Uh, dams and yeah. he pays for them yes. and things mm -hmm. like that. But he is threatening to nullify the entire work of another branch of government. Yeah, well, uh, what's, what's interesting about that actually is that yeah. he, he, he peeled back a little bit very yeah. recently. He basically said, okay, there's some bills I will sign. There are bills that would, if you sign them, free up billions of dollars in federal stimulus money for bridges and schools. Remember the whole thing about whether uh, student evaluate or uh, teacher evaluations sure. could be based on student it's test right. scores. Obama said, I'm not giving you four billion in federal schools money unless you allow the evaluations to be uh, g guided by the test score. So there's a bill to do that. It's on his desk. He's not going to veto that. I mean, it, the bottom line is if they don't get it done, yeah. uh, you know, what, what are we looking at in terms of worst case scenario when you're talking about the Delta, the levees? Well, not, not much. No. Um, I mean, <laughs> and it's, I mean this from ur an urban people. No, 75% um, of America or of uh, California's residents live within um, an hour of the coast. 
Uh, nobody in the Bay Area, even though we're in the third year of a drought, is feeling any pain. There's no mandatory rationing in any Bay Area city. Mm -hmm. The people who are feeling pain are several farm districts that have junior water rights. Just most farmers in the state are getting an okay amount of water, but a few are really getting hammered, just like in a bankruptcy where the last ones in get the yeah. least. Well, the question that's before you, Paul, in your story, it, it, of course, is about the canals and the dam, and that yeah. was where the question was when I was a very young girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, thinking of <laughs> another guy on the uh, that has <laughs> has to do some pretty miraculous things to get ahead. Gavin Newsom may not be faring well uh, in his race for governor, but he was in the headlines because of the healthy San Francisco uh, health care bill. It, the U.S. Supreme Court sure took well. It up. The, uh, the, this San Francisco program, you know, the first of its kind, the one that uh, in, is designed to insure all of our uninsured adults who don't qu qualify for Medi-Cal or, or Medicare. And so far, since 2007, they, or, I guess insure is the wrong word, but provide coverage in a network of clinics uh, and hospitals. And so far, 45,000 of the 60,000 adults in just over two years have gotten coverage. The, the, the legal question is, can you make employers pay for it, uh, pay, pay part of it. And the way the city tries to do that is say that uh, if you don't provide coverage for your employees at a certain level, you got to pay that same dollar amount to the city fund. They, they will then be eligible and will continue to subsidize the, 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 the program. Problem is there's a federal law. I mean, the, the legal problem is that there's a federal law that says that uh, you can't, that, that states and local governments can't regulate uh, employee health benefits. The overall you know, question is, is this something that a city or a state should be able to do while we're debating national health care? Now, San Francisco's program in some ways is a model because there's these payer play programs. And a lot is yeah. hanging on this. Yeah. I mean, President Obama has yeah. talked about this as a mm -hmm. model, <clears throat> and certainly Newsom has hung most of his uh, campaign yeah. for governor on healthy mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco. Yeah. So what, well, I mean, what's the stake here as the Supreme Court looks at this? Could this, uh, should they decide against this? Uh, mm -hmm. Is this a huge blow to universal health care programs? I mean, how, how bad would it be? Well, uh, I, I, get, I think what's at stake is the ability of a local government, in this case, a city or, or perhaps a state, to regulate on its own, to cover its uninsured on its own. Uh, you know, the employers are arguing that this is, you know, preempted, Mostly not allowed the by restaurants, federal. restaurants, the restaurants. Exactly, do, the Golden yeah. Gate Restaurant Association, but backed by major business groups mm -hmm. all around the country are arguing. And the Supreme Court this week asked the Obama administration to chime in, give us your view. I think that means, number one, that they are taking the case seriously, and number two, that it's a close question whether or not they're going to take it. The previous ruling has upheld the program, which means that it can go ahead, it can be a model for other places, and maybe it, uh, if... If, if, the, if the eventual federal bill falls short, uh, you know, cities well, can, can go farther. Is it unusual for the court to do this, to go back and ask the administration where it stands on an issue it while it's debating it? it? It doesn't happen in every case, but it happens often enough in important cases, and particularly in a law like this where it's a question of state power versus federal power. But the big picture yeah. that's really fascinating, yeah. I think, is that if we get a federal health care bill, let's uh -huh. say that liberals don't like, that doesn't have a pure public option, we may very well not because of the yeah. 60 vote issue. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's an opt-in to the public option or some quasi-public yes. option or co-ops or something. Could cities be able, all around the country, frankly liberal cities, mm -hmm. to put in a stronger program than the federal government if, has? If, and I, it seems yeah. like San Francisco, well, New York, like, and many if, others if, would do if that. If this if program can. survives, I, 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 you know, I think that, that that option will be on the table. I don't want to leave the Supreme Court without at least mentioning it's the first week of the term. Justice Sotomayor joined the court. The big issue overshadowing everything is campaign finance. This court could well lift all restrictions on corporate contributions and spending on national elections, and we could be looking at an entirely new, uh, you know, political uh, scenario, uh, financial scenario in a, in a year because of. Uh, a case before this court. So uh, we have lots at stake, mm -hmm. and maybe Gavin Newsom has uh, <laughs> his political fortunes tied in with how this goes, and, and maybe the only thing that could pull him out. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Carla, and Bob, and Paul. And Paul Rogers will join us again later to tell us about the search for water on the moon. Lawmakers in Sacramento recently approved a plan to reduce the state's prison population by about 16,000, saving the state an estimated $300 million, but far less than what Governor Schwarzenegger had proposed. We have received many letters from inmates who say the state could save money by reconsidering the long sentences under California's three strikes law for nonviolent third offenses.
I hope to God someone will let you read this letter as it is intended to provide you with typically overlooked points of view regarding exorbitant costs for keeping nonviolent third strikers in California prisons for the rest of their natural lives. In 1994, California voters passed the toughest three strikes law in the country following the murder of 12-year-old Polly Class by a repeat offender. Her father, Mark Class, remembers. There was absolute outrage, not only in the country, but specifically in the state of California. By November of 1994, the public had voted on the Three Strikes Initiative, and it had passed by 72 to 28 percent. 24 states have Three Strikes laws. In most, the third offense must be serious or violent. But in California, it can be for any offense, though one of the prior convictions must be serious or violent. Today, there are more than 8,000 third strikers in California prisons, and a majority are serving sentences for third offenses that are nonviolent. If you look on this yard, this is a level two facility, and it's full of nonviolent three strikers. I haven't committed, ever committed a serious crime in my life. I never committed a violent crime in my life. I went into the county jail with no rap sheet, and I come out of three strikers. The, the three strikes law, I think, is cruel and unusual because you, you got inmates in here that stole a pair of socks or some bread or something because they was hungry. Solano County District Attorney David Paulson is a strong supporter of California's three strikes law. It works. Three Strikes has incarcerated those offenders who were the revolving door of criminal justice in the 70s and 80s. We had a, one of the highest crime rates in the nation, and Three Strikes changed that. The Three Strikes law um, is really the biggest offender and the biggest problem with our criminal justice system. The Stanford Law School's Three Strikes Clinic has investigated thousands of cases. Clinic founder, Michael Romano. There are currently 4,000 people serving life sentences in California under the Three Strikes Law for nonviolent conduct. Of that group of 4,000, um, at least a quarter um, also have no violence in their criminal histories. A disproportionate number of third strikers are people of color. 40-45% of all three strikers are African American, and only 25% of general prison population is, 20, is African American. A 1998 ruling by the state Supreme Court gave judges and district attorneys some discretion as to when to invoke the law. Since then, the number of offenders sentenced under the three strikes law has slowed. So I think they clearly sent a, a good message to both the prosecutors and the courts. This is serious law. It's a serious consequence. Uh, weigh that carefully and ensure to the public, to the people of this state, that the only people that are being sentenced under three strikes are those that deserve it. The Stanford Clinic staff attorney, Galit Lipa, represents third strikers who feel they don't deserve it. I have a client who has, you know, 0 0.029 grams of heroin. It's one leftover piece on a cotton ball that was his own personal use. One who stole a pair of socks. Um, one who, you know, stole some quarters from a van. Um, you see these guys and you think these are real people who we as a community have decided to lock up forever. If a district attorney believes that, that a person has been unjustly sentenced, uh, that district attorney can make a request uh, to the, through the executive branch, ultimately to the Board of Prison Terms, to have that person return to court for review and possible resentencing. Great idea, it's never been used. Now, I tend to believe it's never been used because there's nobody out there. There's no, there is no crying soul. There's no one out there that says, I was unjustly uh, uh, given a three strike sentence and here's why. I done filed writ after writ after writ to prove that I'm not a three striker. One of my strikes was a strike that was dismissed 35 years ago and they brought it back up and used it as a strike to strike me out. It's not so much the thing that the three strikes has done to me, but it's what it does to our children. Since the time that I've been in jail, which is going on 14 years now, 
I've had three daughters who have been to prison and my son. I, I, I'm not saying that we don't deserve punishment, but society has to take in the consideration of what putting us in prison for these, for these long sentences does to, to the other people that's involved in our lives. After hearing inmate stories at San Quentin Prison, Annette Summers became involved with Families to Amend California's Three Strikes Law. Ideally, we would get it amended to where you could only um, get struck out for something violent or serious. They would still get prison time, but just not 25 years to life across the board for, for nonviolent, non serious things. So that would um, definitely open up a lot of money in the prison system, and hopefully that would and translate back to education and prevention programs in the community. I think three strikes is being, in most counties, reasonably uh, imposed. California Attorney General Jerry Brown says he wouldn't change the law. About 400 a year now are given the three strikes. That's not where our trouble is. The problem with the California prisons is that when they release people, they come back. We've got people that are unable to control their impulses. And I know that it doesn't have to be serious and it doesn't have to be violent. But those individuals understand that if they're prosecuted for those minor infractions even, that they're looking at the possibility of spending the rest of their life in prison. A 2004 ballot measure would have required that a third offense be a serious or violent crime. It was narrowly defeated after a last minute media blitz by Governor Schwarzenegger. But with lawmakers in Sacramento now forced by the budget crisis to make cuts and by the federal government to reduce the prison population, could changes in the three strikes law be part of a solution? I hope, I trust that the, the people of California will realize that the three strikes law um, is unfair, it's uh, disproportionate, and, and it's also tremendously costly. I don't think we should make public safety decisions based upon a budget. Uh, I think we have to make public safety decisions based upon what, what's a, the best for the state of California, best for the people of this state. So given the options and the urgency, what is best for the people of California? It's almost as if people are preferring to take away money from uh, child health care services and sustain this system for no apparent reason other than politics. I know politicians like to talk and be tough on crime, but I think given the current financial situation in California, uh, given the fact that many of these people have already been punished very severely, maybe they should be smart on crime. Revisit it. Change it. Well, there was other news about water this week, but it took place far from the policy dispute in Sacramento. In the early hours of this morning, there was great excitement as the NASA Ames Research Center crashed its L Cross spacecraft into the moon. Scientists are in search of evidence of water beneath the lunar surface. So, Paul Rogers, what exactly happened and what is the significance of what did happen? Well, what happened was uh, NASA rocket scientists went on a fishing expedition to try to see if there's water on the moon. It's a question we've had for a very long time. And uh, back in June, they shot off a rocket from Cape Canaveral. The whole mission was sort of uh, directed and planned from Mountain View, from NASA Ames. And uh, the idea was this craft would circle the moon for a while, it would break into two pieces, and one piece would hurtle down and hit the surface of the moon at 5,600 miles an hour, about 10 times the speed of a jet plane. And it would throw up, at least the theory was, a huge uh, plume of debris and dust. And then the second craft would fly through it with all sorts of instruments and mass spectrometers looking for hydrogen, which is the clue that there could be ice there in this crater uh, mm -hmm. on the moon. It was all so exciting. I mean, it was like watching for a movie premiere mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. uh, with great anticipation. Didn't quite work out like that, though. So we, we have some videotape, okay. so you can see exactly what did happen and what was supposed to happen. Well, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the surface of the moon as it looked this morning at about 4.30 a.m. Uh, Friday morning. And uh, there's the team at NASA Ames. 
And this is a, a graphic on the left of uh, what the thing should have looked like when it hit. But for some reason, what happened was, uh, that's what it should have looked like. That's a computer animation. When this craft hit, it hit in the right place, it hit at the right time, but it didn't throw up any plume that anyone could see. All the world's great telescopes were looking at it, uh, the Keck telescope in Hawaii, the Hubble telescope, and there were hundreds and hundreds of school children in the parking lot at Mountain View. Sergey Brin from Google bought his Tesla down there. And these were people that camped out, they were in sleeping bags. Astronauts came and spoke. In Washington, D.C., Buzz Aldrin was at an event. I mean, this was a big deal for space buffs. And it was kind of anticlimactic because everyone was looking at the at the screen and they didn't see that great plume. And NASA had said, well, in your backyard, if you have a 10-inch telescope or larger, you'll be able to see it too. And the theory now is that um, maybe they had the camera settings wrong, as every amateur photographer knows, if you get the lighting wrong, you can't mm -hmm. see it. Or maybe the thing hit bedrock and not as soft a, a soil as they thought. But the good news is uh, it did throw up some cloud. Uh, they did get some data, we know. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll know whether or not they actually found water. Well, this was so unusual for NASA to have such a party atmosphere. I mean, I would have stayed up last night if I didn't have to show up here tonight. Uh, so it was all very exciting. But in the in the end, though, I mean, why does why should we care? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question, and the answer has to do with the future of human exploration. We've heard people talk a lot about uh, maybe setting up a moon base uh, one day, and actually NASA's plan has been to do that by 2020. But it costs up to $100,000 a gallon to take water to the moon because of the, 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 the cost of lifting the weight up there. And so if you could find ice crystals on the moon and essentially take the dirt and microwave it and make water out of it, uh, you can grow crops, you have water for people to drink, you could even, with the hydrogen in the water, uh, make a fuel that you could then uh, run other machinery or frankly even other rockets off of potentially maybe to Mars or, or somewhere else. So it has a lot to do with our ability uh, to, to go further out into space and it, it, the great thing about this mission it was it was pretty cheap by NASA standards. It was only $79 million. There weren't famous astronauts. It wasn't like the shuttle which cost billions and billions and it was kind of a neat, uh, a neat thing. So it could be uh, that we'll gain something from it when the scientists uh, do their work, but mm -hmm. uh, disappointing a little bit in the pictures that we were able to see. Yeah. The, si right? the scientists would tell you it's probably going to be a success, but for the watchers it wasn't what they had hoped for. Thank you, Paul. Well, that's all the time we have tonight. Be sure to visit our new website at kqed.org slash this week where you can watch complete episodes, comment on our stories, subscribe to our newsletter and podcasts, and share your thoughts in my new question of the week. This week's question, you guessed it. How do you like our new look and format? <laughs> in recognition of Disabilities Culture Month, we leave you with some images from a new exhibit at San Francisco City Hall, organized by Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. It runs through December the 11th. Visit our website for a slideshow and event details. I'm Belva Davis. Thank you for joining us. Good night.